Over the past six to nine months, I've seen patients who have full-blown diabetes go off of their insulin completely. Um, I've seen patients with hypertension that have been on multiple antihypertensives for years come off of all of their medications. Hey guys, this is Klaus from Plant Beasties. Just wanted to let you know about the PBN podcast, which is uh, hosted by uh, Robbie Lockie, who I co-direct Plant Beasties with. Um, it's got some amazing episodes on there. I'll link them down below in the description of this video. And uh, we're going to play the full episode of his interview with Dr. Danielle Bellardo. Hope you enjoy. We have no data to show us that we need animal products and that animal products help us. We only have data to show us that animal products can hurt us and that are associated with more chronic disease, more hypertension, more diabetes, more coronary artery disease, and more cancers. So do we need any animal products? No. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the PBN Podcast. I'm your host, Robbie Lockie. On this week's episode, we are really excited to introduce you to a doctor who is making huge waves over in the US in the medical community. Dr. Danielle Bellardo is originally from New York, but she relocated to Philadelphia after college to study medicine. She earned her medical degree from Drexel University College of Medicine and then completed a three-year internal medicine residency at Temple University Hospital, where she became board certified in internal medicine in 2017. Directly after that residency, Danielle started a cardiology fellowship at Lancaster Heart University, a few miles outside of Philadelphia, on the main line to Pennsylvania, she is dedicated to being a cardiologist that, in addition to traditional medicine, focuses on lifestyle modification and, of course, a plant-based diet in order to prevent heart disease. She is a member of the American College of Cardiology Nutrition and also part of the Lifestyle Subcommittee. Thanks so much for joining us on the PBN Podcast. Hi, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Hi to everyone at Plant Based News and everyone listening. So before we begin um, and talk about everything that you're doing in your life now and all your exciting adventures <laughs> in the world of medicine, uh, let's go back in time and tell us a little bit about how you discovered the plant-based lifestyle and, and the food and everything that you're doing now. Um, where did it all begin? Sure. So um, I would say I had a pretty easy transition to plant-based eating because I never really liked meat my whole adult life. I just, I mean, my whole childhood actually never liked, enjoyed meat. And I always just gravitated away from it. My oldest sister went to vegan first for ethical reasons, animal rights, um, when I was in high school and she was in college. Then my middle sister went to vegan. And then by the time I got to college, I, I went just, I was vegetarian first and then I went to vegan. So I've been plant-based my um, entire adult life. I started out being very interested in plant-based diet from a health perspective, from a medical perspective, especially when I was in medical school, I started to research it and look at the way it could help with chronic disease. And then slowly but surely, as I learned about the ethical portions of the animal rights movement and I became, uh, I'm a plant-based eater, but I would consider myself an all-around ethical vegan. So that's kind of how my journey progressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're of <clears throat> Italian descent, aren't you? And yes. we were talking a little bit earlier about how uh, Italian food culture is is quite heavy in uh, animal products, especially things like cheese uh, and meat right. and cured meats as well. Cured meats feature very heavily in the Italian diet. Um you spent some time in Italy. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experiences with food as a child? And like, were you exposed to a lot of that kind of food? And, and was there much uh, education or awareness at the time when you were growing up? Sure. So with a, a lot of my family, including my parents being from Italy and uh, being not as American as, you know, especially my dad and my grandma who lived with us. Um, and my mom fell, you know, fell into this whole culture. We just essentially followed more of a Mediterranean diet lifestyle, mm -hmm. I would think more than a standard American um, diet growing up. So I would say that overall, comparatively, I think Italians do consume more of a Mediterranean style diet. There still is that cheese and the, um, as you mentioned, the cured meats, but there's still a ton more, I think, on average fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, leg mm -hmm. legumes, and whole grains than there are in the standard American diet. So I would say mm -hmm. con compared to my American counterparts growing up, I probably eat more plant forward. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> definitely, you know, there is a cultural 
issue with regards to cheese and meat. And actually now my parents are completely vegan. And mm, interestingly wow, enough, yeah. So interestingly enough, it, um, it kind of happened. I've told this story before, uh, but uh, people find, seem to find it interesting. So my third year of medical school, so me and my sisters had already been vegan for years. Um, my mom was getting there. My dad has always been what I would consider a healthy carnivore. He followed a very Mediterranean-like lifestyle, was eating tons of fruits, veggies, um, but was still eating fish, some cheese, and some meat, um, but a very, quote unquote, healthy carnivore. Um, so he is a, my whole family is super active. They're all runners, triathletes, et cetera. And it was my third year of med school. And my dad saying to me, you know, I, <clears throat> I have this weird shortness of breath at like my eighth, ninth mile of running. You think I'm mm -hmm. getting asthma. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, you are, you know, 60 years old. You are not just suddenly developing asthma. It's probably something cardiac. So I sent him for a stress test. It came back abnormal. He went for a cath. And they found like a 99% occlusion of his right coronary artery, which is one of the main coronary arteries. You have three main coronary arteries that feed the muscle of your heart. Mm -hmm. And he ended up getting two stents. And my dad has never had diabetes. He's never had hypertension. His cholesterol was always- Do you want to explain what a stent is to anyone who might not oh, know? Oh, sure. Yeah. So stents are um, anyone that's ever had a heart attack or even if they just have a blockage in one of their coronary arteries. A stent is a little device we play place in your coronary artery to open it up, to open up the blockage. Um, once you have a stent placed, you have to be on medications called dual antiplatelet therapy. These are medications to help keep the stents open and blood flowing through them. Stents are life-saving in the setting of an acute heart attack, but mm -hmm. we're finding with a lot of research now that outside of acute heart attack, there was a big trial called Orbita which we can mm -hmm. get into all the research later, but a big trial called Orbita that shows us that actually with chronic stable coronary artery disease, um, a stent actually doesn't improve longevity or chest pain. Mm -hmm. So back to my dad. So he had a, two stents placed in his right coronary artery and he, you know, it was just mind blowing for me because I was vegan at this point, but I thought, wow, my dad's like the healthiest carnivore, meaning like he just mm. was still eating animal products, but tons of plants, tons of fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, legumes. And so what, you know, what I realized is like, we definitely have some genetic component to hypercholesterolemia mm. in my family, but also that, you know, if you do have any genetic pre predisposition, which is almost everyone, then you really should be eating no animal products, like zero, none. And my dad went vegan and my mom went vegan. And I mean, he's still running a gazillion miles a day ever since. So my family transitioned to plant-based nutrition and it's it's been really um, wonderful because I, I think that he was a great example of someone that was a healthy weight, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, but still had that occlusion, you know, very, very tight blockage in his coronary artery. But what does that say to people who, who don't eat a diet high in plants as well as all the animal products that they consume? You know, it, it would make sense that the plants that he was eating probably saved his life. 100%. Yeah. And, and I think this is the irony is, is people keep saying to us, you know, let us eat what we want to eat. <clears throat> yes, I'm eating less meat, but is there any safe amount of animal products in a diet? So what I like to say is there is zero data and zero research that shows us that any animal products make us live longer. There are zero data, zero research that any animal products um, prevent cancer, prevent heart disease, reverse heart disease, do anything for longevity. We have no data to show us that we need animal products and that animal products help us. We only have data to show us that animal products can hurt us and that are associated with more chronic disease, more hypertension, more diabetes, more coronary artery disease, and more cancers. So do we need any animal products? No. That being said, do I expect the entire world to go 100% vegan? Of course, that would I would love that. That would make me mm. nothing more than happy. But for me, when I'm counseling patients, I definitely do take a reducitarian approach with them because there's a lot of literature and research about 
patients having a readiness to change and this being a huge factor with them transitioning to anything with lifestyle modification, whether it Mm -hmm. be smoking, quitting smoking sensation, or um, weight loss and nutrition. You really have to approach it with your patients in order to gain success in a really calm, um, approachable manner in which you're assessing how ready the patient is. So if I say to my patient, well, why don't you just try to cut back animal products and processed foods? Because even even processed vegan foods are unhealthy and bad for your Mm. coronary arteries Mm -hmm. and bad for hypertension. So I try to get my patients to give up animal products, say dairy or meat, whatever they find that, you know, they think that they can give up. I say, start with giving it up one meal a day. And then we try to move to two days a week. And then before they know it, they're finding it's easier and easier. But that being said, I definitely still have patients that come to see me that want to go a hundred percent full in. And they use their day as their first appointment with me as this is the day I'm giving up animal products forever. And they do it and they stick with it and do just fine. So it really is on a case by case basis. But overall, we do know from so much data and evidence that the more plant forward you eat and the more you remove dairy and animal products from your diet, the healthier and more healthful the diet is. So the um, lower all-cause mortality there is, the lower chronic disease there is, such as hypertension, diabetes, and all of the ones I've mentioned. So we do know that there's a a spectrum there. Um, And so we just are trying to encourage people in general to go more plant forward and just drop the animal products and processed foods. And that's no easy, that's actually not an easy process for most people, especially in kind of the Western world where processed foods are everywhere, everywhere. wherever we look. Everywhere. And it's, and, and, you know, I've, I've heard many people talk about these food deserts in the USA where, um, people literally do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables because every supermarket or store that's nearby is just floor to ceiling with processed foods. Um, how in sort of we spoke a bit about how things are slow to change in the kind of years that you've been working in this area how much change have you seen so i'm 32 years old and i've been a doctor for 5 years and um i am a cardiology fellow so what that means cuz in america the training is different than in europe so i did 4 years of college 4 years of um uh, that's four years of undergrad. And then I did four years of medical school. And then I did, um, for us, if you want to subspecialize, you have to do uh, three years of internal medicine residency training. And so I took my board certification and board certified in internal medicine. Instead of just practicing as an internist, I decided to subspecialize in cardiology. So now in my second to last year of cardiovascular disease fellowship. So next year I'll be taking my boards to be a board certified cardiologist. And so in my five years as a physician, my first three years of training, I was, um, during my internal medicine residency, I was at Temple University Hospital, which is just an incredible academic center here in Philadelphia. And it's just such a strong transplant center, lung center, but it's actually located in North Philly, which is one of the places you're mentioning with food deserts. And I was able to, working with one of the um, lowest socioeconomic populations in the country, during my internal medicine three years, during my continuity clinic, I was able to get about 10% of my patient panel to go fully plant-based. And I realized that to me, one thing that I speak largely about, if anyone follows me on social media, you know, one thing I speak to often is that I think the biggest barrier is, is actually physicians giving this information. Because what I realized is that the patients want information. Patients want Mm. to be told that they can take control over their health and their wellness. So many of us in medicine will prejudge and decide which patient, oh, well, they would never, you know, go plant-based or they would never Mm. like really succumb to lifestyle modification. They wouldn't do it. The truth is that so many patients do. So even in a quote unquote food desert area, I was able to find affordable ways for my patients to go plant-based. And the truth is, is that beans, legumes, whole grains, Mm. these are actually inexpensive foods. And there Mm. are ways to find um, fresh fruits and vegetables through different bodegas and even in areas in a city. Um, There's ways to make it work. So I felt really blessed to have an experience in that area. Um, Now I'm on the main line where it's different. I have a different socioeconomic status of the patients that see me. And um, with my plant-based clinic, I have people that drive hours to come see me, fly to come see me. So it's different. But at the same time, I will say that I'll never, you know, I can't thank enough my residency experience and training because I truly learned that 
there can be cultural barriers to going plant-based. There can be mm. uh, financial barriers to going plant-based. But it, the most important thing as a physician or as a healthcare provider is to just support your patients, recognize there may be barriers, and just help them to help them through it. So help them to figure out what's the best way that they can live their healthiest life and how you can and help them achieve it and believe in them. And that's one thing I think in healthcare that we don't have enough of. We don't believe in our patients' dedication to lifestyle modification. And really it, it is there. Mm, absolutely. And and it is difficult for physicians, physicians, I guess, because as I'm sure you can attest when you study, um, you're not exactly directed in this in this vicinity everything is very much focused on uh keeping the status quo when it comes to nutrition you know milk is for calcium meat is for protein (laughs) and and they continue to perpetuate this and do you want to touch a little bit about on how little nutritional training doctors actually get generally speaking so this um i will say uh, on a positive note this is slowly but surely it is changing but when I was in medical school, I graduated medical school in 2014. Um, I'm a U.S. trained MD. I went to Drexel University College of Medicine. We had about one nutrition course in our medical school, which was really focused in biochemistry. We didn't really go extensively over many diets. We definitely didn't touch on plant-based diet. Um, I think the number that's cited most often is like the average U.S. medical student on average gets about like 19 to 20 hours of nutrition education over four years, which is not much. And, you know, in my internal medicine residency training, I had, we have no required uh, nutrition education. And in my cardiovascular disease fellowship, additionally, we have no nutrition um, requirement. Oftentimes people will say to me, actually, one of the critiques I get when I discuss how important nutrition is for physicians, people are saying, well, that's a registered dietitian's job. Why aren't you just referring everyone to a registered dietitian? And my point is, is I find it to be unethical for me as a physician to just be a dispenser of prescriptions? Why Mm -hmm. am I not, as a physician, addressing the underlying etiology? Why am I just managing chronic disease but not trying to fix chronic disease? So Mm. that's my argument for why nutrition is really important in a physician's scope of practice. I'm not trying to take the position of RDs. I think RDs are incredibly, registered dietitians are incredibly important. I just think that this has to be a part of, of, of our scope of practice. You know, I can't Mm. be seeing a patient every single month, adjusting, increasing their antihypertensives or, you know, watching their diabetes get worse and worse without discussing the underlying etiology, which almost always is nutrition. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it must be quite a challenge. I mean, you've, you've mentioned before how things are slow and that actually the doctors are the ones who are holding things back. I mean, have you got any examples, obviously, you know, you, without giving names and <laughs> stuff, but how do you how do you deal with those situations? If there are any doctors, young doctors listening who are vegan or plant based and are frustrated with how slow things are moving in their facilities, in the um, organizations they work with, how, how do you go about creating the change? We'll talk a little bit about the, the, the projects that you've done recently but how did you manage to convince people to to try things i mean have you got tactics or tips yeah so i actually think that one of for me personally i think one of the best ways to get the positive information about plant-based nutrition out there is to be involved in my governing organization for cardiology so thankfully two of my mentors who i love dearly rob ostfeld and kim williams both cardiologists and they are in the on the American College of Cardiology Nutrition Committee. And they invited me to be be a part of the ACC Nutrition Committee. And the American College of Cardiology is our governing body in cardiology. Kim Williams was the president of it. Um, It's just incredibly important. It's the committee that makes uh, this organization makes all of our guidelines. And so I found actually through my involvement in ACC, this is how I want to be involved in helping to change things for cardiologists at starting from our own organization. And Rob and Kim have been a huge, huge, huge part of it. And I really do see things changing because even in the ACC Nutrition Committee, you know, all of the physicians are 
variable on, on the committee. We have omnivores, there's plant-based, but you don't see, I haven't heard much from anyone saying that plants are bad for you or you should go keto. You know, it really does seem that everyone is kind of on the same page with regards to more plants are better for you and less animal products and less processed foods are better for you. We're kind of all, it's slowly but surely, you know, changing in that direction. So I will say that overall, that that is a positive. So I think for physicians of my generation who are learning, we're, you know, we're young physicians. I think that we have a lot of energy. We're all looking a lot to integrate um, prevention into our practices. And I think that getting involved with our individual specialty organizations is a huge part. So the, the way that it's really going to make a true change is once it funnels down to our testing. So once we have, when you study for your USMLE, our board exams, once we have, you know, nutrition integrated into our board exams and heavily integrated into our internal medicine board exams, et cetera, that's when it'll really focus, you know, nutrition will actually have an important part of our practice because it'll be something that we have to learn through our training. Right now, it's just not quite there. Um, it's really, you know, there's a lot to learn as a doctor and nutrition hasn't been a huge focus, but I do think there are medical schools popping up everywhere that are focusing a lot more on nutrition. I know the university of Pennsylvania has been doing a nutrition course that focuses on different types of diets. Um, I know Loma Linda does uh, where the Shurzai's are located. They do a ton of nutrition training. They have a lifestyle medicine group. Um, I think New Jersey's medical school does as well. So I think it's happening. It's slow, but it's it's happening. Because um, my question was, how do we, you know, get the support we need if we're a young doctor, if we're a right. young cardiologist, if we're new in our career, how do we manage to garner the support from people? And I think that, you know, the, the main takeaway from what you've said, from what I understand, is the allies. You know, a lot of these things and in, in creating change is very hard on your own. And it's really important for you to formulate um, a collective of people around you, whether that's online or whether that's other organizations and centers where you can go and spend time or and or foster relationships with people. Would you say that sounds right? No, yeah, absolutely. And and through medical, so the medical field's quite unique for all sorts of practitioners, whether you're a nurse or whether you're a physician or whether you're a primary care provider, any specialty, we do a lot that's just guidelines based. And so I think why it's important Another huge part that's important is research. What I was saying before is that, you know, if if someone's in the position to donate towards research, research, research for nutrition research is needed. So we need more and more studies to show us that plant-based nutrition helps with X disease process, Y disease process. Even though we all know plant-based nutrition helps, the more the research is published, the more it enters our guidelines and just becomes the way that we have to practice. And as you know, there's a lot of you know industry-sponsored research out there that comes from the dairy industry and farming. And so we it's actually quite hard to get research funding for nutrition research on the other end. So I think that there's many ways in which physicians can partner together. And if anyone's in the position to donate to research, I think PCRM and different committees that help to create more research projects for us to change our guidelines later on. Mm, absolutely. Strength in numbers is yes. the key. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're only, we're only going to bring down the behemoth of the uh, animal agriculture industry if we all work together. Right. Um, now, obviously, um, as a movement, uh, the vegan movement is multifaceted. There are doctors, there are activists, there are people in politics, there are teachers and scientists and lots of people of all different sorts. Um, as a person working in medicine, have you had... Um, any challenges when it comes to being because you're you're unashamedly vegan like you don't hide it you're very proud of the fact right. that you're vegan have you had people who have reacted negatively within your in your sphere of influence to the fact that you're vegan because obviously vegans have a bit of a reputation and sometimes it precedes us <laughs> um no you know i found that um it's the way I approach it with my coworkers and with people I work with is that less is more. So, you know, less animal products is better, more plants are better. And I think in general, everyone agrees with that. Whether or not every physician around me wants to go fully plant-based is another issue. But I think that, you know, I think that in general, most doctors 
most, not all, there are the keto crazy carnivore doctors out there, but most doctors do agree a more plant forward diet is helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. One thing that I do get asked a lot though is, oh, how did you create a plant-based preventive cardiology clinic? And how do you how do you get your patients to go vegan and all this stuff? And I try to explain to everyone that you actually, as any physician or you know nurse practitioner or nurse, you actually don't need anything special. You actually just have to talk to the patient. So it really just starts with asking the patient, well, what do you eat? Okay. So have you ever thought about changing your diet? Have you ever given any thought to going plant-based, it, it just starts with a conversation and mm. listening to the patient, figuring out their barriers to change and helping them overcome it. There's no special secret um, to counseling someone on nutrition. It's just being you know there for your patient and being there to support them. So truly any physician can do this and incorporate it into their scope of practice. And I think that as more and more people go vegan, I think that it's actually becoming um, a larger part of our medical community. I, I see, I see it growing. <laughs> Amazing. What are some of the uh, successes that you've had um, switching people from uh, the standard American diet to a whole food plant-based diet? So I actually think this is a great question. And it's actually one of the most important things I think that patients need to know is success stories. Because Sometimes when it comes to weight loss and when it comes to chronic disease, sometimes people just feel like they're stuck. They feel like it's too late for them. They can't change. And I always think it's important to share success stories so people know that there is no reason why they can't be living their best and healthiest life as well. Um, So every Tuesday, I see patients in a preventative cardiology plant-based clinic that I started. And um, I'm fortunate to see unbelievable changes every week to week. I mean, I'm constantly taking people off their antihypertensives. I'm constantly taking people you know, off of their diabetes medications. People are just improving so rapidly when they go on a whole food plant-based diet. One of my most successful stories um, I've had a few that just really stood out. One I presented as a case this October um, at a conference, Montefiore, uh, a cardiology conference, and it was a patient that was in his 60s. He goes to the hospital with shortness of breath and was diagnosed, it was a different hospital than mine, was diagnosed with heart failure. Heart failure is when you know, normal ejection fraction of your heart. It's the left ventricle of your heart and normal ejection fraction is 50, 55%. That means the amount of blood that's being squeezed out of your left ventricle into your aorta to the rest of your body. Well, this patient uh, was diagnosed with heart failure and his ejection fraction was only 10%. That is pretty severe heart wow. failure. He was found to have something called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation as well, which is an abnormal heart rhythm. It's when there's um, an abnormal heart rhythm coming from the top chamber of your heart to the bottom chamber, and it makes your heart go in a rapid rhythm. Um, he was obese. He had high blood pressure. He had numerous medical uh, conditions. So when he was seen in the hospital, they had you know, discussed with him. They had palliative care, see him. He was consulted for palliative care. All of the notes that I read during this hospitalization were more just managing his disease and kind of more end of life kind of supportive treatment. And then mm-hmm. what happened was he went home, he Googled, you know, how can I fix my disease process and found plant-based nutrition, found forks over knives. And, you know, he really changed from being just, he was a standard American diet and then I switched to a vegetarian diet and then went fully whole food plant-based. And within a few, he came to see me in the office and within a few months he had completely lost like 60 or 70 pounds. His ejection fraction went from 10% back up to 55%. 50 to 55 was totally normal. His hypertension had completely disappeared, no more high blood pressure. Um, He had had zero episodes of atrial fibrillation, that abnormal heart rhythm. And he, I mean, he just completely reversed every single disease process that he had had. And so it was outstanding. And even everyone that works with me was like, wow, this this is unbelievable. So 
he's a true success story. And I have many patients like that. I have a patient with um, a 34-year-old female who had uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, which is a uh, OBGYN condition in which essentially it's uh, the etiology of its um, insulin resistance, which, which causes, makes people actually at high risk for cardiovascular disease. But one of the um, side effects of PCOS, besides being at high risk for cardiovascular disease, is they have trouble with fertility. So a patient, a uh, 34-year-old female came and saw me with PCOS. We put her on a strict whole food plant-based diet, no oil, no added fats. She lost 50 pounds and she got pregnant and her PCOS is completely, you know, in remission. So there's a lot that nutrition can do. And I think the success stories are important for patients to hear, to know that they can do it. You know, anyone can do it. Mm. It's incredible. And it's so um, inspiring to hear these stories. And I know we get them all the time for people who've, um, write into us and explain how they've seen a video of ours or they've watched a, a clip or seen a meme which has then led them to an article which has mm-hmm. then led them to watching forks over knives or one of these other films which right. which promote a whole food plant-based diet and they've, they've got off their medication they've lost weight they feel more energy they've they've probably you know their kind of clarity is improved and it's and it's obviously has a knock-on effect they sleep better their relationships improve and it can really transform a person's life um what i find is uh, personally incredibly frustrating is that there is just so much data now and there's just so much um information out there suggesting that this way of eating is great for us it's good for our bodies it's good for the planet it obviously saves uh, the animals a huge amount of suffering even though we you know that from that point we can't really force everyone to care about animals because a lot of people don't unfortunately Mm -hmm. but you know the first two the environment and the health side of things it's just so much great data out there but then when you look out into the world and you just see how many people are still consuming animal products Mm -hmm. uh and the volume in which people are consuming it can become incredibly depressing and it can be quite um soul destroying just to see it you know walking down the street in my in my hometown in London and I see, you know, McDonald's and I see families sitting with their small children consuming burgers and fries and really highly processed foods. And there's obviously many reasons why people end up in these places, socioeconomic reasons, cultural reasons, just education. Um, how do you, you know, obviously you're exposed to disease and you see, um, kind of suffering, uh, you know, you see people suffering, how do you kind of keep moving forward and keep positive as a person through all of this? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I've begun to just reconcile this with that. I think that it's, it's changing slowly, but surely. And, um, one of my favorite quotes, let me look for it. It's, um, I forgot which philosopher said it. It said, all truths pass through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Mm-hmm. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. And I think mm-hmm. with plant-based nutrition and medical everything, I think we're kind of in between two and three. We're be- between that mm-hmm. violently opposed and being accepted as self-evident phase. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it is, it's just a, a slow a slow change, but it's, it's coming. And then there's also, there's also with sometimes with practitioners, there's cognitive dissonance. Um, this is like the description in the field of psychology. Cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort experienced by a person who holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. This discomfort is triggered by a situation in which a person's belief clashes with new evidence perceived by the person. So a lot of times people, their biggest barrier to recommending plant-based nutrition in the health scope, whether they're whatever kind of provider they are, is their own inability to make that lifestyle change. And I'm, I'm empathetic to that. I'm empathetic to that because, and I always remind vegans that I am an ethical vegan and I am a whole food plant-based eater. And this is a huge part of my practice, but I think a big part of helping this movement is having a lot of empathy for those that aren't there yet. Because if we shun them, if we shun people that don't feel the same way as us, we're not welcoming them into plant-based nutrition. So I do have a lot of empathy because at one point, not all of us, but at one point, many of us were omnivores as well. And so we have to remember when that light went off for us to make that switch. And so I think Mm. with healthcare, we are making slow movement, but I think I just try to do it 
through an organized sort of um, way of outreach. I have met so many through social media. I've met so many physicians that say to me, I went plant-based because of your podcast. I went plant-based oh, wow. because of your um, social media. I'm starting to get my patients to go plant-based because of what you've said. And so I think social media is even a great way for us to reach out to other doctors, um, healthcare providers, and and patients and, and individuals out there that are looking for the most healthful diet. The research mm. speaks for itself, like you said. I mean, we have just endless data. And it's it's unbelievable that it could even be opposed. But the truth of it is we just have to keep pushing forward. And I think mm. that the future is plant-based. I really do. I think that we're going to get there. I, I hope before mm. our lifetime's over. <laughs> mm, absolutely. As Dr. Esselstyn says, we're on the cusp of a seismic revolution of change, Yes, <laughs> which yeah. I think is, is such a powerful line. And it's true. We're just on the edge of this big revolution and change. But with every revolution, there's always a counter narrative. There's always going to be people, whether it's, you know, I always joke and say, I think the other day I said, you know, there's no carnivore movement. It's, you know, five five guys in their mother's basement uh, making YouTube videos about eating just meat. This is not a movement. Oh my God. Like, you know, let's, let's really be honest, you know, like oh. there are millions of plant-based people and there are millions of vegans mm -hmm. all the world over working day and night in hospitals in schools, in government, in the media, in uh, you name it, we are there working, trying to change the conventional narrative. We are changing the conversation. And, you know, but these people are there, these carnivore diets and these ketogenic diets, they're there pervading the, the mainstream narrative right. and they're supported by the media. They're supported by uh, animal agriculture and the advertising industry because of the money. Huge amount, follow the money trail, as Jane Bellis Mitchell says, and you will see animal exploitation. You will see huge amounts of disease in humans. I mean, the number one killer of humans is what? In the, it's in the USA, it's what's the number disease, one killer? Of course, heart disease. Right, yeah. caused by what? Caused most, <laughs> over 80% at least is caused by lifestyle. I mean, at least. What, but you're right, by what people eat. So right. the writing's on the wall, but uh, most of humanity seems to have their hands over their faces or mm -hmm. their fingers in their ears going, la, 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 I'm not listening. Do you want to talk a little bit about, little bit about this counter narrative? So let's talk about the ketogenic diet craze and why we should be trying to avoid eating in this way. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, keto is, it's just a craze, as you mentioned, it, it's, yeah, there's just the whole diet space in general is filled with wacky things. Um, I actually do an entire podcast episode on my podcast nutrition rounds called all about fad diets. And we do a deep dive into the plant paradox, which is so silly. Um, we do, uh, in carnivore, we do a deep dive into um, keto. And, and the truth is, is, all of these are just fads. And veganism and going whole food plant-based is not a fad. So I think that we have no data to show us longitudinal health benefits of being in ketosis long-term. We have nothing to show us <clears throat> that this improves mortality. We have nothing to show us this prevents chronic disease in the short term. When someone's on a keto diet, they will have short-term weight loss. They will have a short-term reduction of their hemoglobin A1C, which is something we measure for diabetes. We have a short-term reduction in their higher CRP, which is their inflammatory markers. But that is short-term, and it's because of the weight loss that they get short-term on a ketogenic diet. The amount of saturated fat that you are eating on a ketogenic diet is just will only contribute to mortality because the truth is, is that the way we look at disease is no longer just based on these biomarkers. Although they are important, it's not everything. We know that from eating high animal product diets that you are at a higher risk for colon cancer, you're at a higher risk for diabetes, regardless of how it helps your glucose in the short term. And the reason why is mm. because of inflammation. We know that increasing the amount of animal products you eat increases things like TMAO, IGF-1, all of these inflammatory markers. And inflammation is the etiology of almost all the diseases I see on a daily basis. Inflammation causes coronary artery disease. It causes cancer. It can cause diabetes. So 
you know, inflammation is really at the cusp of this. And your gut microbiome is the starting place for where everything in your body occurs. And so it's really important that you are what you eat is truly an important aspect of your life. And any diet that tells you you can't eat blueberries, which are one of nature's healthiest, most healthful, Mm -hmm. Mm health-promoting antioxidants, phytonutrients, uh, combined product. I mean, any diet that tells you you can't eat blueberries, which includes keto, is crazy. You know, So you have to think that the short-term weight loss, the short-term reduction in anything is just not outweighed by... There's just no benefit long-term that can that, that can outweigh the damage you can do to your body by consuming that much saturated fat and putting your body in the state of ketosis for that long. Mm. Let's on the topic of saturated fat. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a a cover page of the Time magazine with a piece of butter and a and a fork. I don't know if you remember it, mm. where they basically said something like "butter is back" or something like that. <laughs> And obviously, a lot of these studies are industry funded. How we know that saturated fat, I mean, you just think about what saturated fat is, it's this sticky, gluey substance that when we consume, goes into our blood, and it kind of like, you know, causes all kinds of havoc. We know this is a fact. Why does there seem to be this pervading narrative that we can consume as much of this stuff as we want, and it's just magically going to pass through us, or we're not going to? Where does this misinformation come from? And exactly, what are these people? What is what are the what is this what is the kind of biochemistry that they are twisting to kind of suit their narrative? So this is a great question, and this is where I think there's an important distinction to be made between actual science and what goes in the press. So. Any physician that, or scientist or a person that really truly follows nutrition research will tell you that we read the primary literature. So we go to PubMed, we read the trials, we read the research, we read the data samples, we read whether this was a meta-analysis, whether it was a randomized control trial, there are different p-values, there are statistics, there are things that we have spent our entire careers learning how to evaluate a research study. So that takes a lot of time. Then there's the news, there's the press, and they love taking a hot sentence that's going to get a lot of clicks. It's all clickbait. Is eating plants are better for you always the best clickbait? Well, sometimes, but not always. Sometimes butter is back is a huge clickbait. And I actually don't, didn't read that article, so I don't know what study they based that on. But I will say that we just have an overwhelming amount of evidence that plant-based nutrition does help and that saturated fat is the etiology for many of the disease processes. So the biochemistry behind it is very extensive and and, and the truth is, is that you can go through um, multiple research studies that explain it at length, but the way it works is, you know, people think that uh, that eating carbohydrates contributes to diabetes, but saturated fat is actually the largely the culprit for insulin resistance. When you're consuming saturated fat, it creates more insulin resistance in your body, and it creates more intolerance to glucose, but it's not the carbohydrates itself that have caused this intolerance to glucose. So if you take someone on the keto diet who's eating only saturated fat, they may say to you, well, I had diabetes, but now my blood glucose is perfect. It's you know 92 and my blood glucose is well controlled. Well, you're not con- controlling your diabetes. You're just not eating carbohydrates. So put that person through a glucose tolerance test and you'll see their insulin sensitivity is terrible. You know, so the the only way you can actually say that you've reversed diabetes is if you're actually taking that same person, giving them carbohydrates and showing that their insulin sensitivity has improved. And it does not with that much saturated fat, their insulin sensitivity does not improve. Whereas you take a whole food plant-based diet, a diet low in fat, um, high in carbohydrates, and this actually helps to improve insulin sensitivity. And so these patients have less insulin requirements. And this actually goes across the board for type 1 and type 2 diabetics. So for type 2 diabetics, you can actually completely reverse and truly reverse diabetes by putting them on a whole food plant-based diet and decreasing insulin resistance as a whole. For type 1 diabetics, you can actually put them on a whole food plant-based diet, a high carbohydrate, whole food plant-based diet, focusing on fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, 
And you can actually see a ginormous reduction in their insulin requirements because although they still require insulin because the mechanism of type 1 diabetes is different than type 2, although they'll still require insulin, you can actually see such an improvement in their insulin sensitivity. So it really can help them stabilize their blood glucose and have more energy and feel better. So the problem with um, understanding the research is that we have scientists out there, right, that are doing the most incredible work. Dr. Tang at Cleveland Clinic, who is doing all of the TMAO research, which is showing us how dangerous animal products are for us. We have just physicians at Harvard that are doing so much research. Um, Satija, who's done published some of the best studies in Jack. These people are not famous on social media, right? So no one's reading yeah. their primary literature and seeing their amazing studies they're doing that are groundbreaking that are showing us how how important plant-based nutrition is. Um, I try to post these research studies um, and I know that you guys post a lot of research studies, so does Rob and Michelle and all of us in this space. But you know the problem is is that there's the research studies and there's the press and the press just likes mm. to take some clickbait studies that were probably industry funded that aren't randomized controlled trials and that don't really, you know, actually aren't good studies. And I actually think that's a huge part of this too, right? So I think I'm actually going to do an entire podcast episode on this um, w- when I'm at the American College of Cardiology National Conference in two weeks with Kim Eagle. We're going to do an entire podcast episode on how to evaluate a research study because the truth is, is that if you follow the research and you read an article, if you're just reading the abstract and the conclusion, you actually could make the wrong assumption. The reason why I truly believe in plant-based nutrition is because I have read these research articles with a fine tooth comb and I can understand what a good research study is and what a bad one is. And that's where I think the clickbait articles that get published in the press can really deceive people. And so I advise anyone out there that wants to read the primary literature to do that. If you're reading a clickbait article that says butter is back or eating bacon isn't bad for you, try to find what research study is that that based on. Click that research study and read it. Who was it funded by? Was it randomized? How were the p-values? Like how was this research study structured? More than likely, it wasn't structured well. And I think that's an important way to evaluate it critically because there's a difference between scientists and the press. And the press isn't looking for our overall health and wellness. They're looking for clicks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sensationalism is what sells papers. It's all about getting the most uh salacious titles and getting people talking and of course you know put turn the pages of any major publication and and every other advertisement is likely linked to animal agriculture in some right. way um you know you don't see ads for broccoli right. you don't see ads for carrots you see ads for twinkies <laughs> and ads for burgers and ads for chicken thighs and ads for deep fried this and deep fried that mostly meat you know so these are multi trillion pound industries worldwide obviously that um have an incentive and that's money uh, unfortunately we are up against it but we you know we're, the change is happening as you say tell us about when you got a thousand doctors to go plant-based for a week <laughs> yeah so it ended up being like um three or four thousand doctors total that went plant-based 4, yeah amazing. it was incredible and it was um, well yeah, so it was in October, I did a plant-based challenge. And the reason why I did it was because I actually um, have been getting so many requests on social media from doctors that were from all over the country, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, from everywhere saying, I want to go plant-based, but I don't know how, I don't know where to start. And I was like, I do not have the time to answer coach every single doctor that was messaging me on how to go plant-based. And I was like, so how about we just do this together? And so I actually created the challenge out of a response from demand because I found a lot of doctors of my generation wanted to go plant-based. And so I created the challenge. The signups like totally exceeded my expectations. It wasn't for just doctors, but I was shocked that about 4,000 or 4,000 doctors had decided to go plant-based. And The most exciting part about it was how many had stuck with it afterwards. I mean, 
it is so crazy. It's like as if you think we're telling them to, you know, go to Mars. They're like, I can't believe how easy it was to go plant-based. And I'm like, really? Because- I, I remember you saying that on social media, I think. I thought, I thought that it made me chuckle. <laughs> and this is, this is the irony is of our lifestyle. You know, when, when you first start talking to people and you say, I want you to try, eat no animal products for an entire month. People are so terrified. <laughs> it's almost as if you're asking them to stop breathing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, meat is not air. Meat is not oxygen. Exactly. You know, um, what I find so fascinating about all of this is that if you look at what we are as an organism, um, you look at our genetic makeup and our and our um, digestive tract and how we are as creatures, and then you look out into the animal kingdom and you and you know we're animals. We just happen to be able to be um, build civilizations and des- and destroy planets, but we're still animals. Um, how is it that we um, have got to a place where we consume so many other animals? When you look at our closest cousins. The chimpanzees and they eat a 99.9 percent plant-based diet yes they might eat some insects and sometimes they occasionally eat meat but very occasionally you know how is it that people cannot see the writing on the wall that you know we have somehow through our civilization managed to take a really really bad direction um and we're not eating the best diet for our bodies you know it's just it's I, I, that's not really a question. It's more a statement, I guess. But it, <laughs> I completely agree with your it's, statement. You know, it's, you know, it's preposterous. Just, it falls yeah. into the 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 idea of paleo, that the Paleolithic idea of eating mm. like cavemen and all this stuff. It's just so silly. It makes no sense. And mm. some of our well, cavemen died at age. What? How, how long did cavemen yeah, cavemen exactly. live? Exactly. And- what? To what 20 25 maybe if they're lucky. <laughs> and we are longest living populations were the ones that ate most plants and least animal products and that's been proven by the blue zones and by the adventist studies and we just have so much research to show us that and yeah i, I don't know where and why as a humankind we we made the switch um and i totally agree with you that people think it's the craziest thing at first but i think what's beautiful when people go for it and they realize, oh my God, this was so easy. And I'm, you know, and for me, I have to try, I try to have empathy and understand. I I do want to laugh and say, of course it's easy. It's just eating plants. But I do try to have empathy and understand that, you know, at one point, of course there are people that have been vegan since birth, but at one point, many of us, many of us ate meat too. And so maybe culturally we also thought, oh, I couldn't give it up or, you know, it wasn't possible. So I try to remember that and, and, you know, have some compassion in their transition. But I love hearing people say, I cannot believe how easy this was. I can't believe how good I feel. And I think that's important. And the one other point I want to make too about eating plant-based is that, you know, we talk a lot about longevity. We talk a lot about all-cause mortality, decreasing your all-cause mortality with plant-based nutrition. We talk a lot about preventing heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, et cetera, improving erectile function, all these things that are important. But we talk a lot about long-term benefits. And I always do want to incorporate into any discussion about plant-based nutrition is actually it's not just about living your longest life. I don't want someone, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'd rather be on five drugs and eat a steak and live a better life. <clears throat> well, it's not just about living your longest life. It's actually about living your best life because eating a whole food plant-based diet helps with everything starting now. So it helps with your erectile function. Um, it helps with, and I'm actually going to be working on a paper um, that will hopefully be going into the Journal of American Car- Cardiology with Rob about um, Osfeld about plant-based nutrition and erectile function. Um, Mm -hmm. There is, you know, it helps in the, in, in the immediate. So things like that, things like, you know, diabetes and hypertension, even now. So lowering your Um, blood glucose, helping to get more energy. And even if you have no chronic disease, it helps to give you more energy. It helps your gut microbiome decrease inflammation in your body, prevent things like autoimmune disease and make you have more energy, sleep better and live better, improved concentration. And, you know, like 90% of the serotonin in your body is made in your gut. And an unhealthy gut microbiome only contributes to more anxiety and more depression. So eating a whole food plant-based diet, you know, helps to increase your gut health and increase that serotonin production in your gut. So I always try to tell people, you know, because we're very, as a world, 
we're very short term and narrow focused. And so, yeah, sometimes it's hard to convince someone that's 22, you should go plant based because you don't want to get heart disease in 30 years. But I also try to emphasize that it's not just about living longer, it's about living better. And besides the health benefits, which I speak to at length, of course it contributes to a more compassionate world. I mean, we could obviously have an entire another episode about compassion for animals, which I find incredibly important and compassion for, you know, helping the environment, this place that we live, that we're just trashing the way that we live. So I I think it's important to emphasize the benefits of starting now. It's not just a long-term goal. It's a short-term goal and it really does. Mm -hmm. It does matter. Mm, absolutely i'm into that and it's like planting a tree people say when was the best when's the best time to plant a tree and i'm like 10 years ago when's the next best time to plant a tree right now now. (laughs) and that's when and that's what it's about like this is where our health is start investing in your health and your body and looking after and nurturing your body today because your future self will thank you everything that you do now has a you know it's cause and effect or karma as the buddhists as us buddhists call it Mm -hmm. you're laying down the foundation for your future self and your future world and that's why you know we need to live in a world where everything that we do uh, people understand that everything we do everything we buy everything that we eat has a consequence and it's really important for us to be aware of that completely agree that that's so beautifully said. I love that. And I think that one of the most inspiring things for me that I've seen as a physician is that, you know, I counsel patients to go plant-based for their health. And I've been so honored that so many patients have trusted me to go plant-based for their health. And I want to say that one of the most beautiful things that I've seen come out of this is not only their health benefits, I can't even tell you how many patients of mine went plant-based for health and now have become full ethical vegans. So now I find them, you know, they went plant-based at first just for their diabetes or just for their hypertension. Well, they got their health problems completely reversed. And now they're checking their shampoo bottles to see, make sure it hasn't been tested on animals. They're, they're checking to make sure that they're not contributing to anything that has animal cruelty. And I find that beautiful. I really think it does come full circle and it's just, it's a really beautiful process. How can people follow your progress and where can people kind of, uh, take part in your adventures. <laughs> sure. So I'm on social media um, at the veggie MD. Um, I have a podcast called Nutrition Rounds where I interview physicians in lifestyle medicine and we discuss uh, plant-based nutrition on every single disease process you can imagine. Um, and I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at the veggie MD. Amazing. Before I let you go, I always like to ask my guests one final question. If you're on that desert island with the pig, you know the joke about, oh, if you were on a desert island with a pig. Is, oh, wait, wait what is <laughs> but, it? But you're, stu- but you're stuck on this desert island. You're obviously a vegan. You're not ah, going to eat the pig. No, your pig's no, your friend. No. If, I, if, I, if you could only take, a, what, if, you, if I gave you a book, a vegan dish, and a music album, and that's all you had, those three things, what would you take with you? So I get to bring all three. So all three, but you only have one of each, obviously. Okay. So for the vegan dish, I'd want something that me and the pig could eat. Um, and so I'd have to figure that out because I don't actually know what pigs eat. So I'd have to that would I'd have to do a little research on that because I want to make sure that we both have something to eat we could share. Then for <laughs> for a book, um, probably Finding Ultra by Rich Roll is one of my favorite books. It's fantastic. And for an album. Ooh, that's a tough one. I have a very, it would have to be something from Taylor Swift. Um, maybe Red. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> thank well, you. thank you so much for joining us on the PBM podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be back next week. And thanks for joining us. I've been your host, Robbie Lockie. I'll be back with more veganism, health, fashion, technology, and everything else in between. 